Good morning, everybody, and welcome to IVMF's VetNet webinars. My name is uh, Elvis Abdich. I am uh, IVMF Post Program Support Service Advisor here at IVMF. And today with us, we have Stars and Stripes uh, Access to Capital session. Live with us is Aristotle and Thomas. I'm going to pass to them so they can introduce themselves. But before we go, I just want to let everyone know whoever is joining the session, if you guys have any questions, please save in for the after the presentation. You can type it into the chat box. And just remember, this session is being recorded, and all of you will receive a recorded link after the session is over. Thank you, and uh, I'll pass it to Aristotle to introduce himself and Stars and Stripes, and go from there. Aristotle. Elvis, thank you for having us. My name is Aristotle Montgomery. I'm the, pre the president of Stars and Stripes Business Financial Literacy. I have with me also Thomas, who's going to be the main presenter for this Access the Capital webinar. So I want to hand it off to Thomas and have him give an introduction. Awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to spend a few minutes talking about a very important topic called access to capital. We're going to actually start with a quote you see there on your screen from the United States Small Business Administration. It costs money to start and operate a successful business. Funding your business is one of the first and most important financial choices most business owners make. How you choose to fund your business could affect how you structure and run your business. What that means to us is putting together a business plan, which we'll talk about as important, both from an internal and external perspective. But we need to keep in mind, what is our access to capital? Because a grandiose business plan that requires millions of dollars may never be implemented. In some cases, we need to build and, and, and unroll our organization in steps consistent with the capital access that we have. So we're going to have a very practical discussion for the next few minutes about how to access capital. As far as introductions, so Aristotle briefly introduced himself. He's the president of Stars and Stripes, a 501c3 based out of East Texas, or Texas. They're a member of the Money Smart for Small Business Alliance that was formed by the FDIC and it's promoted by the SBA. So what that means in a nutshell, he's very, as a veteran, he's very much focused on helping individuals like yourselves understand how to navigate the process to access capital to start and grow a business to reach your potential. Now, on my behalf, uh, as you may my, my shirt here, I'm a full-time college professor. I teach financial literacy and small business management at Tyler Junior College, also in Tyler, Texas. And so our role is, is providing uh, with ICS is to provide the, the back office support in helping with the funding mechanisms, and we'll talk more about that as we go along. What's important to understand is that this curriculum was not developed in isolation. It was actually developed by current and former SCORE mentors, SBDC advisors, business bankers, to help close that gap. There are so many small businesses across the country that feel that they're unable to reach their potential because of not having access to capital. And what we're going to do is show you how to overcome those barriers to build a bridge from maybe where you're at to where you need to be. In terms of, of my background, just to establish some credibility, I'm a former SCORE mentor, so out of North Texas, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I was on the board and actually responsible for conducting live workshops for entrepreneurs across a 14-county area. Uh, coming out of graduate school, I was a senior consultant with Deloitte, worked on large capital raises for, uh, for businesses nationally. I was with the Small Business Development Center, and I, I hold them in high regard. The SBDCs provide a very valuable service, but there are some things that, that they're not able to do in terms of the breadth of capital that's available in the marketplace, especially when it comes to business credit and equity-based capital raise, and we'll, we'll talk about both of those today. Uh, I'm a co-founder of, of ICS and, as I mentioned, a professor at, at Tyler Junior College. I have an MBA in finance, MHA, healthcare administration and strategic planning, and undergraduate degree in accounting. Our learning objectives today really are threefold. Number one, we want to talk about 
business credit. It's an often overlooked and underutilized strategy to access capital. So we're going to take a, a pretty deep dive this morning into what is business credit, how does it work, how might you be able to leverage it for your organization. Secondly, we're going to talk about some key common mistakes that we frequently see small business owners make. Now, I want to caveat that with the fact that there are different sources of capital based upon your mitigating circumstances. That's one of the most common mistakes that we see entrepreneurs make. They kind of roll everything together and they're looking for simplified and standardized answers. But rather it be, what type of credit score do I need to have? Or is there a minimum time in business? Those are generic questions that have to be framed in terms of, well, which type of capital are we talking about? We can go get a business loan with a 550 personal credit score. We can get an SBA loan with no minimum time in business, but different types of capital have different underwriting criteria. So in learning objective number two, we're going to talk about some common mistakes, but you always want to stop and think, depending upon what your capital acquisition plan is, and we'll offer to help you create one of those free after the, the session, but depending upon your roadmap of accessing capital will determine what the requirements are. Regardless, we'll talk about some common mistakes, and then third, we'll talk about a grant subsidized program that we have that's available to help. So let's go ahead and dig into business credit. And this is building credit off of your EIN versus your social security number. As I mentioned, I have an MBA in finance. This was not talked about. I used to work at Deloitte and it wasn't something that we did. If you talk to uh, local business bankers, uh, credit union uh, lenders, they typically are not familiar with or not out educating and talking about how you can leverage business credit as a source of capital. We're going to dig into that now. So why does it matter? Well, most people fail when they try to get money to start and grow a business. It's important to understand, as I mentioned before, there's different types of capital based upon your mitigating circumstances. That's the first thing we need to do is find the right type of capital for your circumstance. And then secondly, every type of capital has an underwriting criteria or a matrix. If you meet the underwriting criteria, you're approved. They're wiring the money into your account or providing you access to the relevant type of capital. If you don't meet the underwriting criteria, then you're declined. And often, in many cases, you don't get a real transparent and, and thorough understanding of, well, why wasn't I approved? So we need to understand the right type of capital for your circumstance and meet the underwriting criteria. Let's talk a little bit about the specifics of business credit here. Most people do not understand the differences between business credit building and the, the key differences of business credit. So let's talk about those. Number one, business credit always works. It's analogous to when you turned 18. When you turned 18, you probably didn't have any bad credit, didn't have any good credit. It was a clean slate. And that's frankly probably where most of, of the businesses are uh, across the nation because business credit building doesn't happen by accident. You have to be purposeful, thoughtful, and take explicit action to build your business credit. So even whether your business is one day old or several years old, chances are it's, it's, it's at the neutral starting point. We've done nothing wrong, done nothing good. But the good news is we can build business credit faster than we can personal credit. And my, mark, my stray marks are going crazy. Sorry about that. Number two, business credit is publicly visible. So unlike personal credit, where if I don't have your permission, you don't have my permission, we can't pull each other's personal credit. Business credit can be seen by your clients, your prospects, by your competitors. What does that mean? They can be using that information, even if you're not worried about accessing capital off your business credit, they can be using that information and it in fact could make a difference of how well your business does. I can tell you with certainty, a lot of the larger organizations, uh, 
sometimes government contracts, Amazon, Walmart will pull Dun and Bradstreet reports as part of their decision to work with vendors or not. The third point here is that unfortunately business credit seems a little bit stacked against us as entrepreneurs because by default you'll have a negative business credit score even though you've done nothing wrong and I'll show you some examples of that as we move along. All right, so three key differences, business credit from personal credit. It always works and, and it does so faster. Publicly visible, so even if you don't care about uh, using business credit to access capital, other people may be using that information that impacts your growth. And third, your default is you typically have a failing business credit score that reflects negatively. And I'll show you examples of that. Well, what is business credit? It's obviously credit obtained under the business name, not you personally. You have to be careful. You know, if you go to your local bank and say, I want a business credit card, they'll give you one and it's kind of glossy. So it'll have your company name and silver letters uh, uh, with your name, personal name underneath it. You say, oh, I've got a business credit card. Well, is it a business credit card? Is it reporting under your EIN alone or is it really just co-branded with your business. So with business credit, it's a true business credit, it's building its own credit profile under the EIN, under the business entity. It's not based upon your credit worthiness as an individual owner, and it's not based on your ability to pay. It's based upon the businesses. Now, while business credit alone can be a source of capital, and, and, and we advocate for that, of course, it's also important to understand that it very well could impact your access to business loans. For instance, the SBA, the SBA has a requirement of a 140, we'll talk often about a 165, but a 140 FICO score to get approved for an SBA loan. And people say, well, I didn't even know credit scores went that low, or that must be a mistake. Well, there are 50, 50 different FICO credit score algorithms. What we typically will do is we'll make a mistake and we'll use our consumer eyes and, and, and judgment. But when in the terms of business finance and in business credit, the, the SBA, for example, uses FICO SBSS, a different scoring system that goes from zero to 300. So we need to be in that 140 to 165 area to qualify. The average small business owner says, I don't even know where I'm at. I know maybe what my personal score is and maybe it's good or not so good. But for an SBA loan, we need typically a 165 FICO for most lenders. So what's the point? Business credit affects the, the terms, the approval amounts, and uh, getting approved or, or not simply put, for many other sources of capital, it just may not be explicitly described to you, so it's an easy element to overlook that could impact your access to capital. And the last point there is businesses can access more capital off of their business credit than we can off of our personal credit. Actually, according to the SBA, you'll see that on the last bullet there, businesses have 10 to 100 times the borrowing limits that individuals have. So there's more money through business credit than there is personal. What I'd like to do is, is show you an example here, and this is a bit of a busy slide, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. The top box is from Experian Business, which is one of the, the three main business credit bureaus. So there's Dun & Bradstreet, DNB for short, which we'll talk more about, Experian Business, and Equifax Business. Now I know you'd say, well, oh yeah, Experian and Equifax does personal credit too. Yes, but you need to keep those separate. The, the departments are separate, the algorithms are separate. We're talking about Experian Business. So at the top of this slide, we have a bunch of zeros and not applicable. So most likely this is where your business is now. You have no trade lines reporting, no extensions of credit reporting on your Experian business. And so when you look in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see a yellow box with a 28 in it. Now that's on a zero to 100 scale or a one. 
one to 100 scale. So a 28 is not so good, right? That, that does not reflect positively. So what's the point? Almost every small business that we've worked with through the years that we've been doing this will start right here. Even though they've done nothing wrong, they've done nothing right, they've not established any payment experiences or trade lines. So by default, Experian Business is typically going to give you a score of a 28 on a 1 to 100 basis. Doesn't look so good. But what's interesting is if you look down at the bottom, and I'll try using the pencil again and hopefully won't mark it up this time, go all the way down here and you see the credit limit recommendation. This is insightful, right? Because if I came to you with this type of low equivalent personal credit score, the credit limit recommendation probably zero, right? But even with a very low Experian Intelli score, hmm, the credit limit recommendation is still a thousand. And, and that's exactly what we see when we're helping small businesses build their business credit worthiness. We typically can get five to eight thousand dollars of business credit in the first 24 or 48 hours. Because even though we're starting kind of the clean slate with with not such a strong score, we still have access to capital. So baseline information. This is very very typical. It's not unusual. Small business hasn't added any trade lines, any payment experiences on their business credit. They start with a 28 score. Now let's move on and talk about what we can do about that. When we work with clients, we're going, and, and I'll describe the process in a few minutes, but part of it is to add positive business credit and, and have positive payment experiences. Now we're going to go down. Well, first we'll look at this bar, the, the top blue bar here. We've added in this example to an, a client's IntelliScore, Experian IntelliScore, one trade line, just a net 30 account to get started. That resulted in a dramatic boost in our IntelliScore. Again, 100 base. We were at a 28 a moment ago with, with no activity, one positive payment experience, bam, we went up to a very good score, a very credible score. Also, let's look a little deeper and look at what happened to our credit limit recommendation. It actually more than doubled. I realize it's still only 2,500. That's probably not enough for your capital raise goals. But just by showing the system that we opened a trade line, we followed the terms, we made an on-time payment, bam, we went up considerably. So I mentioned earlier, business credit builds quicker than personal credit. This is a great example of that. There are many other differences we're going to have to go into so you understand how business credit behaves different personal credit, but it does respond quickly. Now, because the, the webinar software that we're using today does not allow animation, what you see is just Walmart. But what's on this slide, in fact, is a half dozen or so noticeable businesses. And what we're illustrating is how many different trade lines that each have. Ultimately, though, you can see at the top that Walmart has 513. And the, the, what's the point? The point is, as small business owners, we need to take into consideration what large businesses do that is credible and effective that might be able to be used at, at our level as, as a small business, whether we're startup or, or existing. The bottom line is business credit is important to the big guys. It probably should be more important to small businesses as well. Okay, this summary slide here, I'll uh, attempt to use the, the blue. So let's talk about some key vocabulary. Uh, Dun and Bradstreet, one of the, the largest, most significant business credit bureaus, DB for short, they issue a Paydex score. So your business credit score is a Paydex score, again, on that one, one to 100 basis. Now, Dun and Bradstreet operates different. What I showed you earlier, and we'll summarize on the right hand side, is accurate for Experian business. What I said with Experian business is you normally will start with a high 20 score on a 1 to 100 basis, but we can build it very quickly. In fact, by adding just one trade line, one on time payment experience, we can really bump it up. Dun and Bradstreet's different. 
it requires at least four trade lines reporting to generate any score. So you'll have a zero at to begin with versus a 28 or 29, but simply adding one or two or three payment experiences from one, two or three trade lines won't make a difference. It takes full four to trigger a Paydex score. But we'll help you do that, don't worry. Experian Business, we've talked about, again, their business credit scores are called IntelliScores, but again, still on a 1 to 100 basis. The truth is we really need to get to an 80 or above to be considered credible. It's not quite like personal credit where, you know, you get to the 700 and it's not good enough. You want 720 and ultimately you want to get part of the 800 club. Not quite so important on business credit. We just want to make sure at least we have your Experian IntelliScore and your Paydex at least to an 80. Now, if we want to leverage business credit as a source of capital, we're going to continue to build, and I'll show you examples of that in a minute. Another key term that we didn't talk about is DBT. Do, do you know what DBT stands for? Days beyond term. So that's when a new issuer of credit is looking at your business and deciding, should I approve, should I extend credit, whether it be a loan or a line of credit or a revolving installment. Well, what do you want to have for your DBT? A zero, right? Because that means predictably you'll pay on time. You won't pay any days beyond term. If your DBT score is a five, that means on average you pay five days late. So if someone's going to extend credit to you, they're going to go into it realizing, hmm, I'm going to have to wait an extra five days for this company. So you need to know what your DBT is now. We'll let you know that. We're going to pull your Dun & Bradstreet. We're going to pull your Experian Business Reports, and we're going to analyze those for you as part of the curriculum. Trade lines we talked some about, and, and that's the bottom line. of that's an, an issuer of credit has reported to one or more of the bureaus, and it shows how you're managing that. Payment experiences seems more common sense than what it is. And this is another area where personal credit differs from business credit. Business credit, you're getting, exper you're getting credit or, or, or acknowledgement typically of only one payment experience per trade line. In, in contrast with personal credit, you could go get a credit card secured or otherwise, buy gas or groceries every month, keep making payments, and those payment experiences will really spiral up your personal score. What's the point? The point is we're going to need more trade lines under your EIN to accomplish the growth goal. It's because we're only going to get typically credit or acknowledgement of payment experience one time per trade line. The short of it is we're going to probably need to build 10 to 15 trade lines under your EIN if we want to fully leverage the power of business credit. And then credit limit recommendations. We saw a little bit of that, right? And we'll actually go over here to the right-hand side. So this is the same little box we saw earlier. We started with a baseline of nothing good, nothing bad. We had a 28 score out of 100, and a, but still credit limit recommendation of 1,000, which is excellent. It means we're going to be able to access capital even though we're at a, a low starting point. This is the same second slide we looked at earlier. We had one net 30 account that more than doubled our credit limit recommendation, definitely improved our IntelliScore. But what we didn't look at before is what happens if we keep building and we keep building and we add 10 to 15 trade lines. Now we're able to go get a business car or truck under your business name, under your EIN, under your business credit without a personal guarantee. And you can see the credit limit recommendations by adding 10 to 15 trade lines becomes very significant. You can even compare that on the personal credit side. You would have to have extraordinary personable, personal demonstrated taxable income to qualify for almost three quarters of a million dollars of, of uh, credit personally. But from a business, we can accomplish that by just going through this process. All right, so what is the process? How do we build business credit? Well, it starts with the setup of your business. Now, 
we want to be very careful, and, and I mentioned this before, but I'm going to reiterate it. Different sources of capital have different underwriting criteria. We do a lot with SBA loans, not only filling out, but filling out the paperwork, but helping the small business owner meet the underwriting criteria, providing the TA, the technical assistance, the preparedness. Well, my point is we can go get an SBA loan for a brand new startup business that's simply a sole proprietorship or a DBA. That's okay. When it comes to business credit, we cannot build business credit off of DBA, sole proprietorship, or partnership. We need to have a more formal, structured entity, such as an LLC, a C Corp, or S Corp, or even a nonprofit. We will need an EIN also. And an EIN, of course, is the employer identification number analogous to the Social Security number for individuals, free and easy to get. But to build business credit, we're going to need an EIN. Now, again, we're talking about criteria for business credit. We need a commercial business address. Now, you may work from your back bedroom in your pajamas every day. No one really cares about that. If we're going to build business credit, our address of record needs to be a commercial address, not a, a mailbox, postal box, not a home address. And then that address needs to be used consistently with the federal government, the IRS for the EIN, uh, with your state, with the bank that you work with. So to build business credit, we're going to need to have a physical business address. Now, in many areas across the country, there's virtual offices and incubators and co-working spaces that can provide that affordably without you having to go out and, and spend a lot of money to lease a dedicated office or even buy a building if, you're, if you don't need a storefront. Another important requirement is to have a business phone number. So uh, a lot of us don't have home phones anymore, but even a cell phone number does not work. It's seen as less credible. So we can get a, a Google Voice or a Ring Central, or there's different providers. You can go with local phone service. You can have that business number ported or directed to your cell phone. No one cares, again, if you're working in, from your back bedroom in your pajamas or using your cell phone for your business. But the phone number of record needs to be a, a business phone number that's listed with directory assistance, 411. Again, we'll help you through that process. I'm just trying to describe these are not prerequisites for us to start working with you to help you build business credit, but you just need to go into this eyes wide open. There's underwriting criteria, and I'm highlighting some of those. Then, number two, what we're going to do is pull your Dun & Bradstreet and Experian business and, and even look for your Equifax, which is not all, often found uh, early on. We want to make sure that those profiles are set up accurately and completely. And I'll tell you, in most cases, they aren't. Because Dun & Bradstreet, for example, they're going to pull from public information from usually your, your state, uh, Secretary of State, and, and they're going to try to put their profile. But almost always, it's error-ridden and that impacts your access to capital. So the address may not be quite right, company phone number, revenue figures, employee count, industry code. If you have no industry code listed, they're going to assume that you're a high risk industry, when in fact your industry may not be high risk. By default, the absence of an industry code on your profile leaves a perception that you're high risk. What's the point? We're going to pull the business credit reports. We're going to analyze those and help you clean those up. So now we're ready to start building business credit. And there are two ways to build business credit here on the third bullet. We can do the fast track way. And, and we commonly do this. We have a client I was just speaking to this morning. He's going to get his first $60,000 of business credit in about the first month. So the fast track is opening up roving trade lines under your EIN very quickly. Now, the prerequisite for that is we, we have to have decent personal credit because we're doing a personal guarantee in the background. These won't typically report on your personal credit. It's going to report on, on the business credit reports we've been talking about. But since 
you haven't necessarily established business credit worthiness enough for that to happen on its own, the fast track has the personal guarantee in the background. We have a client, we, we raised 100, uh, Georgia raised 150,000 in about 30 days. So the fast track works well and it's called UBF, Unsecured Business Financing. So it's great, frankly, they don't care about your business plan. They don't require a minimum time in business. It's very accessible cash. Now, secondly, we can do an organic build, and that's where we're starting with some net 30 accounts, building our business credit uh, report organically without any personal guarantees. Then we go into store revolving accounts, and then ultimately we can get into unrestricted capital. So two different ways to build business credit, it's the same. We can help you figure out what's the best path for your circumstance. Again, since uh, this webinar software doesn't allow for animation, you can't tell, but there's a bunch of examples stacked on this slide of examples of, of business credit uh, ranging. Uh, you can see 24,000 over here on an American Express card and 50,000 here on another American Express, but there's Bank of America and other examples there. Okay, so that concludes that learning objective about business credit, what it is, why it's important, two ways to raise, to build it, fast track and organic, and uh, we'd love to collaborate with you and help you in, in doing that. Now let's move on, though, to the second learning objective, which is our Cal Ready program. And, and the way I'll describe it, I love pizza. I don't know if you like pizza or not, but if, if you go order a full pizza, let's just imagine that they cut it in 10 equal slices. And that's the Capital Ready Program. There's 10 aspects to the full Capital Ready Program. One slice of that is business credit. We've just, we spent half an hour probably, what, right, talking about why business credit's important. But if we're trying to look at all sources of capital, there's more to it than just simply having a strong business credit profile. So now we're gonna step back and look at the whole pizza rather than just that one slice. Why does that matter? Again, it was developed to help small businesses access capital regardless if they're pre-launched, they're just a concept, they've not even started yet, or if they are a startup or existing to start, grow, and reach their potential. The Capital Ready program that we're describing does not compete with banks and lenders. We're providing, again, what's called the TA, the technical assistance to help you, number one, identify the right type of capital for your circumstance, and number two, meet the underwriting criteria. And in fact, we frequently get referrals from banks and credit unions because that's typically what the small business owner will do, right? They'll go to the lender and apply. They may not be fully prepared. They may not enter into that relationship with the best possible foot forward because they're not fully prepared. We believe that you should receive the technical assistance first, get your package together, get prepared, know exactly what you're looking for, be prepped to answer the questions correctly and honestly, and that way we have a much higher likelihood because sometimes there's not a second chance to make a first impression with the lender. So what we're going to do through the Capital Ready program is get you with a finance officer right away to figure out what sources of capital do you qualify for right now. And so that, that may be a little, maybe a lot. I would say 90% of our clients, we can get interim funding in the first 30 days. So not saying that the full capital raise is recognized, but it's, just, it's not unusual that we need to go through multiple tranches of capital to get to the end capital raise goal. It doesn't always happen from zero to 60 in just one swoop. We're gonna to put together that lender compliance business plan. You know, business plans are kind of a dime a dozen, right? You can go get templates online and score an SBDC. Again, I've been with both of those organizations, but what's the truth about a business plan? The truth is the business plan needs to be developed specifically for the reader, for your targeted type of capital. We do a lot with SBA 7A Express loans. Do you know what type of business plan they're looking for? One page, one page with the answer to specific questions. You give it more than that, it doesn't help. It slows the process. 
So we need to keep that in mind. If we're going for an equity-based capital raise, sometimes debt is not the right answer. Maybe in some cases it's equity, which could be from your sphere of influence or from an outside equity in injection, different components to the business plan. We need to work on an optimized personal financial statement. PFS for short, it demonstrates your, your net worth. Seems kind of common, right? Or common sense. So, okay, I just, I re record my assets and liabilities and it'll be fine. Not at all. Probably 90% of the PFSs that we see, the baseline what the client has created is flawed, significantly flawed. So again, we're never gonna lie, cheat or steal, but there's an art to optimizing that personal financial statement, which affects your access to capital. We're gonna help you with that. We are not credit repair, but we certainly are going to help you build your business credit, which we just talked about, and also optimize your personal credit. In some cases, we need to take some steps, as I mentioned before. We might go get that first business loan and use some of those proceeds to move some of your revolving debt, your credit card debt, and get it over as an installment debt through the business. What happens? Well, when your revolving utilization drops from high to, to low or below 30%, inversely, your credit score goes up almost immediately, right within 30 days, once it reports again. And so now all of a sudden, when you might not have qualified for business loans, larger loans, lines of credit, you may now just simply by structuring the debt that you have. So we help in that area. If we need interim financial statements and as well as financial projections, we're big advocates for using QuickBooks or something like that to have a structured approach to recording your revenue and expenses. Whether you want to do that in-house or outsource it to a bookkeeper or an accountant, that's your choice. But we really can't get away from the importance of tracking revenue and expenses because many sources of capital, not all, but many will need to be financial statements, income statements, balance sheets. Your uses of funds is, is key. We've seen many clients that were rejected for their loan, not because of the rest of their application package, but their uses of funds were flawed. And so different types of capital have different permissible uses of uses of funds. So we'll always be ethical, honest, and, and accurate, but we can be creative here in terms of how to get your uses of funds in your loan package to meet your capital raise goals. Now, what is unusual about the program we received and, and the grant funding that we received to administer it is we guarantee any participant at least a $100,000 capital raise. Now, people will shake their head and say, that's hogwash. You, you can't guarantee any small business off the street, $100,000 capital raise. Well, we can, and, and it's because of the secret sauce, the business credit, right? So even if someone has terrible personal credit and they've not filed their tax returns and they've not paid their child support or student loans, they have no collateral, they have no cash flow, so they're essentially not eligible yet for any traditional source of capital we can still build off of, of the EIN, off the business credit. So it is very credible and uh, we can always raise at least 100,000. We just simply don't know up front what the different tranches or sources of capital will be until we dig into the relationship. But we can be assured of at least $100,000 capital raise. A couple of quick examples of the type of funding through the Capital Ready Program. Uh, the 7A loans I mentioned, uh, startups qualify, which is great. Uh, we have a client that uh, is a bookkeeper. So she, she does QuickBooks for other businesses. And so she, in fact, uh, we were able to get her about $50,000 of an SBA loan pretty quickly to provide some working capital. But 7A Express loans up to 150,000 in around 15 days. Sounds too good to be true, but it's not. So we, when we find specific uh, lenders that have a specific appetite for a type of, of loan that can accelerate the process, and as I mentioned, technically the SBA is looking for at least a 140, but we're going to need a 165. 504 loans are more for hard assets like real estate and equipment, and those can go uh, up very high. 
fast seed capital we, we do a lot of those where it's more of a micro loan a small loan often used to restructure debt as we talked about before or get things started and those can fund very quickly in an average of a week or so and they often have some subsidized underwriting criteria so even a 500 something credit score could very well be approved unsecured business financing we talked about a moment ago uh, that falls under the, the business credit criteria. And then there's all kinds of other sources of capital, including uh, moving your 401k money around, not breaking it, not paying penalties or fees, uh, using private equity, crowdfunding, and so forth. So as we've talked about, many different types of capital, and that's one of the unique attributes of our approach is we look at the, conti the entire continuum of sources of capital all the way from business credit to mainstream SBA, all the way over to private equity. So let's do a quick review and then we'll take some questions and talk about next steps. All right, so what is something that you, and, and since uh, we don't have two way audio here, what is, as you reflect, what's something that you learned that makes business credit different than personal credit? Is it that business credit always works? Is it that it's faster, that we can access more capital under our EIN than we can our social security number? Those would all be examples, as well as the fact that your business credit starts as negative. We saw examples of that. Secondly, why do most small business owners fail when trying to access capital? Well, if nothing else you take away from today's webinar, it's those two points we've reiterated. Most small business owners don't know what the right type of capital is for their mitigating circumstance. That's a major barrier, right? Secondly, is in most cases, they don't meet the underwriting criteria, so then they're declined. But inversely, if we find the right type of capital for their circumstance and seek to meet the underwriting criteria, we get approved. Were there any new vocabulary terms that you learned today that we went through? Were you familiar with Paydex scores and DBTs? If not, uh, hopefully we help you expand your, your business finance vocabulary. We talked briefly about the difference between different types of SBA loans, and they have different underwriting criteria in terms of even the biz type of business plan that's needed. The 7A Express is, is awesome. Again, up to 150,000, funds in around 15 days, startups qualify. What is the minimum personal credit to score to qualify for a business loan? Well, the truth is that there are some lenders in some circumstances that don't even have a minimum. They're going to be looking at other types of underwriting criteria. But in general, if we're at a 550 or above, we can usually qualify for a business loan. Does your business need to be profitable to qualify for a business loan? And the answer is, is no. Uh, we need to project out a profit at least by year three, and, and those financial projections are going to help you with. But, you know, unless you're Lyft or Uber or, or one of those uh, unique business models in general, we need to be trying to generate a profit sooner the better, right? Is there anything that you learned today about how to properly set up your business to improve your access to capital? Always remember, different types of capital have different underwriting criteria. But on our business credit learning objective, we said we need a true business, an LLC, C Corp, or S Corp. We need to have a commercial address. We need to have a phone number, for example. All right, great discussion there. I'm going to turn this back over to Aristotle, and uh, he certainly can talk to you about next steps. Aristotle? Sure. And the next step that is on the screen is to please take a moment and go to our website to fill out an inquiry for our free capital acquisition consultation. And I did see that there was some, some discussion in the chat box. Um, let's see, I think Natasha had a question. Um, El Elvis, are you able to hand off to her to, to give her a verbal question and maybe expand on what she's asking? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Arsul. Uh, Natasha, if you want to ask, uh, you know, I, I, now you can unmute yourself and ask the question.
So let's see if she can uh, explain. And while we're waiting for Natasha to come back, I'll, I'll take a stab at, at interpreting her question. Uh, one part is, what if the goal is to raise more than 100000 and, and that's right. We agree on the 100000 as an example because it's the minimum level that we need to reach to qualify for the grant funding. But regardless, uh, certainly many small businesses will need a, a larger capital raise. We try to break it into to now and later, short term and long term, but uh, yeah, there, there, there's no cap. I mean, we, we could go after millions and millions of dollars. Of course, we need to pick the right type of capital and meet the underwriting criteria. She asked about interest, and you know, we're not the lender, so we can't quote interest rates. We're going to have to begin a client relationship, build the capital acquisition plan to see what the right roadmap is. There's almost always going to be a cost of capital. We don't really operate, we don't operate in administering grants. We're fortunate that we receive some grant funding to be able to provide some of these services at a subsidized rate. But we're not here to give out grant money. We don't have any grant money to give out. So there's always going to be a cost of capital. And that could either be for debt-based or equity-based capital. Back to you, Elvis. Thank you, Thomas. My question for you guys is, since we have a lot of IBMF uh, graduates or entrepreneurs and are very interested in your uh, services, can you walk very quickly like uh, of the process if somebody wants to utilize stars and stripes for you know to receive a loan up to hundred thousand dollars like uh, what would it be initial stages and you know can you just look at quickly rock walk through what they expect sure and i think tom is going to handle this question perfect so if you go to the stars and stripes website what we're going to do is you, you can fill out and request um, a free consultation and that's where we need to start is having a conversation one-on-one -on -one, looking at your circumstances and your goals and make sure that you're you're a good fit what we would do then is enroll you if you are a good fit into the program and because of some of the the grant subsidies we have it's it's frankly only three hundred dollars to enroll into the program a one-time processing fee for that and, and truthfully, that's covering our cost for getting the business credit reports, which are needed. We have a very transparent 10 step process that we go through Elvis. And, and so step one is enrollment. Step two is gathering data about the business, which frankly helps us build the business plan. Step three is working on the personal financial statement. Step four is gathering some other data like applicable tax returns and bank statements and owner bio. Step five is, is uh, pulling the business credit reports, optimizing those profiles and, and getting those to be credit worthy. Step six is to pull, pull the personal credit, see what we have there and, and how that might limit or expand our options. Step seven is putting together the revenue projections out 36 months, month by month. Step eight is expense projections for the same time period. Step nine of the 10 is to build the uses of funds. What is it that we want the money for? How are we going to use it? Because that impacts the sources of capital. Step 10 is we roll all that together. In most cases, we'll be able to get interim funding, as I mentioned earlier, in the first 30 days, even though we may not have completed everything else. But uh, those are the 10 steps, Elvis, that we go through. Thank you, Thomas. Unusual, how long does it take for uh, somebody to receive a loan through you guys? Another great question. So our, our goal is to get interim financing for clients in the first 30 days. But obviously, if, if you read into that, what that means, Elvis, is that means where the rat in life now. Because in that at that point, we've not really changed their circumstances. We're just working with them their baseline information. If we're going to try to build business credit, which we always advocate for, then you have to go back to that slide where we talked about, well, we can do it fast or we can do it organic. If it's fast, we should be able to get 50 to $100,000 in 30 to 45 days. That's the, the norm. Sounds great. If it's an organic build, then it's going to take about 120, 150 days to get to that same goal. 
ultimately the, the timeline is much more impacted by the client than us because it, it's it's how responsive they are and how engaged they are. In terms of SBA loans, the 7A Express, once we have that package ready to submit into them, they're turning it around in an average of two to three weeks, which is awesome. And that's up to 150,000. Uh, we do a lot with, with real estate. So if we're going after a 504 loan, much different, right? Now that the building has to be appraised and a survey and a title search. And so those can take much longer. So unfortunately, the answer, Elvis, is it varies, but the general guidelines would be we're going to try to get interim financing, initial financing within the first 30 days, and many sources of capital can fund certainly within the first 60. Thank you, Thomas. Can you touch a little more about like uh, the requirements of the individual like applying for you guys? Because you mentioned like depending on them mostly to get you all the stuff that you guys need. Right, and I don't think there's any initial requirements for the veteran uh, before they come and reach out to us. Uh, we, we deal primarily with startups and obviously existing businesses, so there are no requirements. We'll, we'll take uh, the, the veteran as what they are now and then work them up to be able to become capital ready. Thank you. And uh, can you also uh, go back to the, um, you mentioned the fees, uh, $300. Is that a, for a limited time or is that for a while? And he's he's asking about the $300 fee. Right. The, the, the $300 processing fee is the, the only out of pocket to get started. Uh, frankly, historically, we didn't collect that up front. We collected that later in the process, but we need that data. And, and Dunn and Bradstreet and Experian Business, uh, for example, do not give those reports away for free. There, there's a cost for those. So uh, we're, we're locked in. And so clients will be able to enroll and get started with just $300 out of pocket. Thank you, Thomas, because we still have uh, about 2,500 on our website, so we're going to have to change that. Right, right. If anybody has any more questions for uh, Thomas and also please type into the chat box. But besides that, um, Thank you guys for your time. We almost we only have a few more minutes left. So. Oh, sure. Yep. And, and definitely the next step is to go to our website, ssfinancialliteracy.org. Um, going there onto our capital acquisition plan page, you can put in an inquiry form. It is free. And obviously, we'll, we'll do that free capital acquisition consultation for our clients. Thank you, guys. And. Uh, the loans are that you guys mentioned. You go after SBA loans. Uh, and are there are there any other loans that you guys go after? Elvis, that's a good question. And so I think one of the, the key differences of our approach is taking a very broad look at, at sources of capital. So um, for for loans, they could be SBA or, or not SBA guaranteed, as as you know and probably the, the listeners know. The SBA doesn't actually loan the money; they guarantee the money. It's going to go through a, uh, an SBA lender, a, a bank. Lines of credit. Uh, we talked a little bit about the 401k financing. We talk about different types of revolving, for instance, accessing credit cards under the business name. In terms of uh, automobile financing if, if they need one or more automobiles that could be positioned under the business credit. There's the whole side of, of equity-based capital, which I think is often overlooked, where instead of, of money that's borrowed that has to be paid back, using equity partners may be a, a good source of capital. So it, it's much more than, than SBA loans. Regardless, our core competency, Elvis, is, is helping the client put together their package because that's the key. If, again, if we meet the, pick the right type of capital and meet the underwriting criteria, so it's that technical assistance of getting the documents and resources and, and helping them get their personal financials in order so they qualify for the selected source of capital. Thank you guys very much.
I do appreciate it. It looks like we don't have any more questions, but just want to let everyone know out there, whoever registered and whoever is watching, we will. This session is being recorded, and we will send you the recorded link, and we will also post on our VetNet YouTube channel as well. So thank you guys again, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Hey, thank you I'm again, Elvis. So if no more questions, I'm going to stop the recording. and. Uh, Excellent. And, and I just want to thank everyone for their service and to tuning in to us tonight. And... Um, Hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you, guys. I'm going to stop the recording.